Hey people, it's Nas talking. Now I've had loads of different ideas about what I wanted to do, but this one seemed to be the most important because it's something that I wanted to do for a while, but I've just never got around to doing it. So this is about Caliph Browder. The title, is, of course, is Black Lives Matter, Caliph Browder. So this is an article from New Yorker. Here it goes. Last fall, I wrote about a young man named Caliph Browder who spent three years on Rikers Island while being convicted of a crime. He'd been arrested in the spring of 2010 at age 16 for a robbery he insisted he had never committed. Then he spent more than 1,000 days on Rikers waiting for a trial that never happened. During that time, he endured about two years in solitary confinement where he attempted to end his life several times. Once in February 2012, he ripped his bedsheet into strips, tied them together to create a noose, and tried to hang himself from the light fixture in his cell. In November of 2013, six months after he left Rikers, Browder attempted suicide again. This time he tried to hang himself at home from a banister and he was taken to the psychiatric ward to see Barnabas Hospital, not far from his home in the Bronx. When I met him in the spring of 2014, he appeared to be more stable. Then late last year, about two months after my story about him happened, he stopped going to classes at Bronx Community College. During the week of Christmas, he was confined in a psych ward at Harlem Hospital. One day after his release, he was hospitalized again, this time back in St. Barnabas. When I visited him there on January 9th, he did not seem like himself. He was gaunt, restless, and deeply paranoid. He had recently thrown out his brand new television, he explained, because it was watching me. After two years at St. Barnabas, Browder was released and sent back home. Then, the next day, his lawyer, Paula V. Prestia, got a call from an official at Browns Community College. An anonymous donor who had likely read the New, York sto- New Yorker story had offered to pay his tuition for the semester. This happy news pro- prompted Browder to re-enroll. For the next few months, he seemed to thrive. He rode his bicycle back and forth to school every day. He no longer got panic attacks sitting in the classroom, and he earned better grades than he had the prior semester. Ever since I'd met him, Browder had been telling me stories about having been abused by officers and inmates on Rikers. The stories were disturbing, but I did not fully appreciate what he'd experienced until this past April when I obtained surveillance footage of an officer assaulting him and a, of a large group of inmates pummeling and kicking him. I sat next to Caliph while he watched these videos for the first time. After we discussed whether they should be published on the New Yorker's website, I told him that it was his decision. He said to put them online. He was driven by the same motive that led him to talk to me for the first time a year earlier. He wanted the public to know what he had gone through so that nobody else would have to endure the same ordeals. His willingness to tell his story publicly and his ability to recount it with great insight ultimately helped persuade Mayor Bill de Blasio to try to reform the city's court system and the end the sort of excessive delays that kept him in jail for so long. Browder's story also caught the attention of Rand Paul. Actually, just go back to that. You know, Sean James mentioned this in his one of his videos where he talked about the plan to close Rikers Island and then and have prisons in the New York boroughs. He said that if uh, the delays were ended, Caliph Browder would have spent no more than six months in jail, because that's according to New York state law. You're only supposed to spend that amount of time before you're brought to trial. Anyway, let's go back to the story. Browder's story also caught the attention of uh, Rand Paul, who who began talking about him on the campaign trail. Jay-Z met with Browder after watching the videos. Rosie O'Donnell invited him on The View last year, and recently had him over for dinner. Browder could be a very private person, he told almost nobody about meeting O'Donnell or Jay-Z. However, in a picture taken of him with Jay-Z, who draped an arm around his shoulder, Browder looked euphoric. Last Monday, Prestia, who had filed a lawsuit on Browder's behalf against the city, noticed that Browder had put up a couple of odd posts on Facebook. When Prestia sent him a text message asking what was going on, Browder insisted he was okay. Are you sure everything is cool? Prestia wrote. Browder replied, yeah, I'm alright, thanks, man. The two spoke on Wednesday, and Browder did seem fine. On Saturday afternoon, Prestia got a call from Browder's mother. He had committed suicide. That night, Prestia and I visited the family home in the Bronx. Fifteen relatives, aunts, uncles, cousins sat crammed together in the front room with his parents and siblings. The mood was alternately depressed, angry, and confused. Two empty bottles of Browder's antipsychotic drugs sat on a table. Was it possible that taking the drug had caused him to commit suicide, or could he have stopped taking it and become suicidal as a result? His relatives recounted stories he told them about being starved and beaten by guards and Rikers. They spoke about his paranoia, about how he often suspected the cops or some other authority figures were after him. His mother explained that the night before he told her, Ma, I can't take it anymore. Caliph, you've got a lot of people in your corner, she told him. Uh, one cousin recalled that when Browder first got home from jail, he would walk to GED prep class every day, almost an hour each way. Another cousin remembered seeing him see by the kitchen each morning with his schoolwork spread out before him. His parents showed me his bedroom on the second floor. Next to his bed was Airbook Air, was his Airbook Air. Rosie McDonald had given it to him. A bicycle stood by the closet. There were two holes near the door which he had made with his fists some months earlier. Mustard yellow sheets covered his bed, and to the side of the room atop a jumble of clothes, 
There were two mustard yellow strips that he had evidently torn from his bedsheets. As his father explained, he had apparently decided that the torn strips of sheet were not strong enough. That afternoon, about 12.15pm, he went into another bedroom, pulled out the air conditioner, and pushed himself out through the hole in the wall, feet first with a cord wrapped around his neck. His mother was the only other person at home at that time. After she heard a loud thumping noise, she went upstairs to investigate, but couldn't figure out what had happened. It wasn't until she went outside to the backyard and looked up that she realized her youngest child had hanged himself. That evening in a room packed with family members, Prestia said this case is bigger than Michael Brown. In that case, in which a police officer shot Brown, an unarmed teenager in Ferguson, Missouri, Preston Prestia recalled that there were conflicting stories about what ha- happened, and the incident took, he, he said, one minute in t- uh, time. In the case of Caliph Browder, he said, when you go over the three years that he spent in jail and all the horrific details he endured, it's unbelievable that this could happen to a teenager in New York City. He didn't get tortured in some prison camp in another country. It was right here! And I said that for emphasis because I want you to remember this because they keep talking about human rights in other countries, but America doesn't have human rights for its own citizens who are not even convicted of a crime. Anyway... Uh, I'm going to leave some more links. Now, the, the New Yorker will only allow you to do about three or four stories without subscribing, so I'm going to try and see if I can find others. I think there's a, a film on Netflix you can watch, so uh, I'll try to put up some different links so you can read up more on the story, but it, it's pretty straightforward in the, the scheme of things. So, to Caliph Browder, let's try and keep his memory alive. Rest in power, little bro. And if you like... Uh, this video, please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. If you want to support the GoFundMe, I'll leave that in the description. I'll leave my Instagram there. And um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Peace.